thank you all for coming and, and welcome again to the first California Dairy Sustainability Summit. I am John Talbot, the CEO of the California Milk Advisory Board, and I'm going to be moderating uh, the next panel here, um, and uh, we'll get that going. Um, you know, sustainability means a lot of different things to different people. And many of us here probably think about sustainability relative to farming or environmental uh, kind of perspectives. But over the next couple days, we're going to get into a whole variety of those different perspectives. But right now, and starting off in this first panel, we're going to be exploring what sustainability means to consumers and our customers both in general and as it relates to dairy. And I realize there are some here in the room that may not be as familiar with dairy, so I'm going to start with a couple notes just in general about the dairy industry. And despite what you may have heard about declines in fluid milk, um, dairy consumption is alive and well. This chart shows actually U.S. per capita consumption and when you look at total dairy, you can see we continue to grow. And in fact, in the last five, six years, we've seen significant growth, uh, driven primarily by cheese, yogurt, and butter. California is also the largest milk producing state in the country, contributing $65 billion in dairy-related economic activity and 189,000 jobs. But consumer attitudes and preferences are evolving at a rapid pace. Consumers want to know where their food comes from. They want to know who makes it, how they make it. They want um, They have a heightened concern for the environment and for farming in general, animal care, and they favor companies that are concerned about more than just the bottom line. Now, also, many consumers may not really understand what sustainability is all about, but as many as a third of them are now choosing to buy from brands that they believe are doing some kind of social or environmental good. One big company example of this is Walmart. Now, Walmart is by far the largest retailer in the US and, and certainly within the world as well. And they have taken notice of this fact. And they have initiated a program called Project Gigaton, where they are working with their suppliers to help reduce greenhouse gas emissions in their supply chain by one gigaton. That is one billion tons. So a very aggressive goal. Now Walmart is doing some things for suppliers, now, and that includes many food manufacturers, to help them work with Walmart on this goal. And one of the things is they've developed a sustainability index for many product categories. And they're encouraging suppliers to get involved in this program. In fact, back in 2012, Walmart set an internal goal for themselves that by 2017, they would get 70% of their product from companies that are also engaged in Project Gigaton and using the sustainability index. So what's going on here in this hyper competitive consumer product environment we are in is that we have to work with players like Walmart. We have to be there. And when, we, when you look at it, if two products are trying to get on the shelf at Walmart and all other things being equal, the product with the best sustainability story is going to win every time. So that brings us back to our topic for the day and specifically what we will be discussing here in this panel, and that is all about sustainability, but looking at it 
at least now, from a consumer and a customer perspective. So we've got a great panel of speakers with us today. And how this is going to work, I'm going to introduce each of them individually and then ask them an individual question just to get us kicked off and give them a chance to talk a little bit about their company or their background. And then we'll get into a little more general discussion and ultimately we'll open it up uh, to the floor for some questions. Now you should see on your table there is a stack of cards and those cards are for you to write down your questions and we'll have runners uh, a little bit later uh, that'll pick up those cards and bring them up here to the stage. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to switch microphones here. Come down and sit with you folks. Is that on? Yep. And I'm going to start actually with Linda. Linda Atherton on the okay, end uh, is a partner at Ketchum, a global public relations firm. She is managing director of their global food and beverage practice, a post she has held for nearly 20 years. Her entire career has been in service to the food and agriculture industry. Prior to Ketchum, she held leadership roles at both Kraft Foods and Dairy Management, Inc. At Ketchum, she leads over 300 individuals worldwide who are at work solving reputational issues, marketing branded products and ingredients, and strengthening stakeholder relationships for both supply and value chain organizations. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. Linda, um, help us set the stage here. How do consumers define sustainability? And what are their expectations relative to sustainability for dairy? You know, that's almost like trying to identify uh, why is there air. You know, it's, there's so many answers to this question. And I think the fascinating piece of this puzzle is that it is a concept, not a thing. The concept. And it's a concept that we define and our consumers are defining every day by their experiences with us and with our products. If they have good experiences, they define us one way. If they have not such great experiences, they define us a different way. They're in constant search today for new ways to look at us, the food we produce, and the value of what they're purchasing for their family, for their health, and it doesn't really matter. You know, I used to think that um, we were kind of stuck in a politically correct world where we were all trying to work around being politically correct. I think we've moved on, and I think the consumer is now working to define their world not by political correctness, by instead what's right. They're looking to identify what's right and make that a part of their life. And when they look at our food and they identify things they like and they expect, that becomes part of the set of variables that they use to define what is right. What is right for me, what is right for my planet, what is right for my community, what's right for my body. And when they identify what's right, what's the right thing to do, they tend to put a label on it and Health is one word they use. They use health very broadly, but sustainability is very much related to that kind of health. It's a healthier way of looking at food, a healthier way of looking at the brand, the label, and the inside of the product, as well as the packaging. Um, I think we are not going to be finding at any time soon a single definition or a group of individuals who all adhere to one specific set of variables or definitions. And for us to either regulate it or identify it or try and box it and define it is frankly, in my personal opinion, folly. I think what we need to do instead is pay attention to what they're saying. And what it is today is what it is, and what it will be tomorrow is what it is, and our job is to evolve and to grow with their changing needs and definitions. Great, thank you. I'm gonna move down to the other end here, Bob. Uh, Bob Langert joined McDonald's in 1983, holding management positions in logistics, packaging, and purchasing. In the 1990s, he had responsibility for the environment, energy management, animal welfare, and Ronald McDonald charities. 
He was appointed McDonald's first VP of Sustainability in 2006, where he led the development of McDonald's 2020 sustainability vision and framework, including McDonald's commitment to the environment, supply chain sustainability, and balanced menu choices. He retired from McDonald's in 2015 and joined Green Biz, writing a regular column titled The Inside View, <coughs> and has written a book recently entitled The Battle to Do Good Inside McDonald's Sustainability Journey. Bob. It's been quite a journey. Yes. <laughs> Go back to the early days at McDonald's effort to promote sustainability. What were some of the signals that led you to believe this was an important consumer issue, and how did you overcome some of the skepticism you faced internally at McDonald's? Well, the greatest signal we had is, uh, do you remember the polystyrene? They call it the styrofoam container back in the 80s. And uh, some of you may be too young to realize we used to use that foam container. Well, customers didn't like it in the late 80s. And uh, McDonald's was used as a symbol of uh, a burgeoning waste in the world. And uh, we're a symbol of the disposable society. And for the first time ever, you know, McDonald's was under attack. Uh, and the, we had thousands of these polystyrene containers sent to our home office. I would go to school, and this wasn't just, I mean, it was driven by activists, no doubt about it. Uh, and by the way, it was a bogus issue. There's plenty of landfill space today. You know, it's just it's, it's unbelievable how that issue disappeared. But the reality was consumers really latched onto this. In a sense that I would go to uh, th these containers that were sent back to us were sent by teachers and students. I'd be going to high schools. I remember being in this high school in the Washington State area. Thousand people there, people hanging, students were hanging from the rafters, all with anger towards McDonald's. And for us at McDonald's, it's like since 1955, everybody loved McDonald's. We were the golden arches, you know, and uh, all of a sudden you don't like us. And we were called Ronald McToxic. So, you know, within McDonald's, I would say our reaction, and by the way, our reaction was probably it, for 20 years. I mean, I'm talking about a long period of time. We were in denial about this kind of movement. I sure wish we would have done some of the more strategic things we ended up doing later back in the late 80s or, or 90s. You know, we, we thought, hey, we're a good company. We're good people. Those people are nuts. They're wrong. We're right. Uh, let's just hang loose. So I would say we had a 20 period of flourishing, be, being defensive <laughs> and being reactionary. And we did a lot of good things during that time. You know, this group would probably be very interested in all the animal welfare issues that we got involved with, which that's been quite a journey. And it certainly was driven by activism and NGOs and, you know, and people that perhaps both you and I you know, don't like a whole lot. Uh, on the other hand, you got to look at what's really happened. Another signal, really, is this power of the NGO. There's a slide I would often show in presentations, internal McDonald's, external, about the trust and credibility of McDonald's versus all the other stakeholders in the world. McDonald's had a negative score below the zero line of you know, trust in a multinational company, whereas NGOs had scores like up here. And so, you know, who are people going to believe? Are they going to believe the NGOs, like the Environmental Defense Fund, or are they going to believe in McDonald's? So what we learned over the years is that you've got to partner with these groups. Uh, and I, I've heard also about this journey of the consumer. I know why you invited me today, because McDonald's serves 70 million people a day in 119 countries. And if there's a company that I think knows the consumer better than any organization in the world, I do believe it's McDonald's. Because we, uh, we don't serve a niche customer, believe it or not. We serve every demographic there is. And uh, I'll tell you this, the consumers always cared about this issue since day one. We used to look for focus groups back in the early 90s. We were trying to create a new package made out of potato starch to solve the polystyrene issue. It failed. It was called Earth Shell. Uh, in California, by the way. The, uh, but we'd, we'd try to find focus groups of people that didn't care about the environment. We couldn't find them. It was really hard to find you know, people that didn't care. So uh, I think my last comment about the journey, and we'll talk more during the panel, is this idea of transparency. I would say that once the internet hit, and I know when the internet hit, 
because uh, there's this campaign called McSpotlight. Uh, look it up. Uh, McDonald's made one of the worst PR decisions ever made in history by a company by suing two you know, unknown individuals in the UK for spreading millions of leaflets across the UK with falsehoods about McDonald's. We sued them. We gave them the longest court case in the Royal Courts of Justice history. Three years, more money. The judge ended up saying we sort of won, but we lost because we were culpably responsible for things like animal welfare. And it really impacted our, our company. But more than anything else, the internet, that McSpotlight campaign, it went global. You know, before that time, before 1995, you could do whatever you want. And it's like, you don't know what's happening in the UK. You don't know what's happening in Nebraska. I mean, it's just like, so, you know, the world has changed a lot, this, this transparency. And I think what's really important for all of us in this room on this journey is the trust factor. You know, McDonald's always measured trust all the way back to our creation. And uh, trust in food and trust in the food system. And I think this transparency has really put us all on edge as to trying to, instead of defending our food, like Frank said, I, I think we should be more proud of our food, but why can't we, we do it? But hey, our, our journey you know, uh, continues. You know, McDonald's created a, a framework and a strategy in 2014. We finally, how many years is that? I mean, it's uh, like 25 years it took us to go from defense to offense. We created a strategy that set goals, targets, we define sustainability for our organization rather than let others define it for us. And I tell you what, if any of you, you know, haven't done that yet, that's what you need to do. I mean, it's, it sounds like a simple answer, but it's not going to go away. Uh, I don't understand why people in food and ag let all the crazy people run everything and define everything. Define it for yourself. Work with the partners that make sense. Base it on science. Set goals, metrics, accountability. That is what the consumer expects. The consumer expects you to care, act, be open and honest, admit your failures, and continuous improvement. That's the formula. Great. Thank you, Bob. Next to him, uh, Alex Plazak has worked for Nestle USA for 20-plus years in sales and marketing across various business units from Purina Pet Care to Dryer's Grand Ice Cream. He led the haagen ice cream brand for five years. Now, as Director of Marketing, he leads a team across Nestle USA's $10 billion food business, linking brand marketing and customer selling teams in shopper marketing efforts. Alex has a passion for marketing and sustainability in food and agriculture industries. Most recently, his team completed the establishment and planting of the largest permanent hedgerow habitat project for pollinator sustainability, i.e. honeybees, on a commercial farm in the USA. Alex, as the largest food and beverage company in the world, um, how does Nestle look at sustainability? And maybe how does it look at it from a brand perspective? So I'm not the expert in the organization like you are from a sustainability perspective on a global basis. We have a team of people that works on that. What I'd love to talk to you a little bit about is, is how a brand team or someone responsible for a, a smaller business thinks about sustainability. First, I just want to tell you I'm honored to be here. Uh, I personally believe that farmers are going to save this place. That the work that you all do every single day and the passion you have about the uh, ecosystem that you live in and you manage is more important than probably anything else that we as human beings are going to do. From a brand perspective, uh, I think it's really important for us to think about what consumers really value. You really have to spend some time understanding who is paying your paycheck and what they actually value in your business. And that comes down to uh, a great quality product, right? You start with that, and then you start building what makes your product unique. And sustainability is becoming a much bigger topic for consumers. I think a great analogy begins with um, uh, another company that's doing a great job in sustainability, and that would be Patagonia. How many people know about Patagonia, the brand? So what's really interesting about Patagonia is that uh, Yvonne Chouinard, the CEO of Patagonia, will say that 8 out of 10 people will buy Patagonia because it looks good and it works really well. They have no idea the amount of 
energy that Patagonia puts into their sustainability initiative. But for those people that do care about it, which is about 10 to 20 percent, they are some of the best um, outdoor products available. What Patagonia has figured out is what consumers are willing to pay for, and they're some of the most expensive products on the marketplace. And so the job of your marketing team needs to be able to figure out what consumers are willing to pay more for and introduce those features and benefits to your products that you can do profitably, what makes your products truly unique. That takes curiosity on your team's part. And if you don't have curious marketers or curious people on your team, then you need to educate them quick. You're all here learning. I learned so much this morning, this week, in these 30 minutes. Uh, about what's actually going on in animal agriculture, we need your entire teams to be um, much more educated. And if they're not interested in getting educated, get new people. It's as simple as that, because this is central to what's going on in our business. The other piece that I talk about really briefly about from a brand perspective is understanding what's going on from consumers' perspective, what they actually believe is happening. And, and Frank talked about um, his students and a lot of his students are interested in vegan products. It's a little scary to see actually how many people are interested in this space over just the past five years. But what we're not doing a great job of is telling great stories. So uh, one analogy to that is, go back to my Patagonia example, those guys create catalogs every year, every season. And in that catalog, at least a third of the catalog is just stories about what Patagonia is doing in the world. And it is great reading material. What I would encourage all people who make products that consumers buy is make sure that you have a story that really matters, that you make it really simple, and you tell it in as many different ways and as many different forms as you possibly can. Because it will start to stick. It is the only way you build equity in what can be a commodity uh, business, and that is food. The way you get more margin, the way you get more profit is by having a story people actually believe in that matters to them. And so sustainability has been a, a key part of, of what we're doing at Nestle on a global basis and uh, on a brand basis. Great. Thank you. OK, David. David Allum is the Chief Executive Officer and President for Hillmar Cheese Company. He held previous roles as Chief Operating Officer, Vice President and General Manager of Cheese Operations, and VP of Milk Procurement. David joined Hillmar Cheese in 2004, and in 2006, as Site Manager of the Texas plant, led the company's greenfield plant startup effort and was instrumental in the development of milk supply for the state-of-the-art facility. He's an active member of the dairy industry, serving as chair of the National Cheese Institute, and is a board member of the International Dairy Foods Association, the Innovation Center for U.S. Dairy, and the Dairy Institute of California. David, unlike Nestle or McDonald's, Hillmar is primarily a, a private label and ingredient supplier. Tell us a little bit about Hillmar and how you look at sustainability. Is your approach any different? Uh, thanks. John, and I, I did just make a note to myself to never follow Frank again, <laughs> by the way. Did, didn't he do a great job? Yeah, he did I think that was job. tremendous. So I think I, I, I had enough to go home at that point. But uh, so try to keep that energy level up is a challenge. But yeah, we, so we are in this B2B space, and we're a little different in a sense that we're uh, not talking directly to consumers. Our customers are, and our customers' customers are. I, what I like to say is we're, we're stuck in the, we're kind of in the middle, we're the last to hear, but I like to say we have the most to say, actually, because we're the folks making the product and the dairy farm families that are supplying us are supplying us with the milk and producing it. So we feel like this discussion, while it feels like it may be out here in this consumer world, like we need to be in the middle of that and we need to lead because we have a lot to say, because we're the folks that understand production practices, are the stewards of the land and the resources that we have. So our, our role, and, and we've kind of gone down that track of defining sustainability in terms of a healthy planet, healthy people, and healthy animals and healthy communities. That's how we look, kind of that healthy um, framework, but is to really kind of connect our customers' customers and our dairy suppliers 
and help connect one kind of to shared values. So what are the things we're all shooting for together? So we're looking for environmental sustainability. We're looking to meet social concerns. And actually, on most of those fronts, we have the same shared values. So how do we build a system of transparency and a system that builds trust and really connects um, on the, in that framework? And so more and more, we feel like that's what that's kind of where we fit in the equation, is really connecting producers to consumers and building those systems and that visibility and transparency that builds trust. That's great, thanks. Just a, a couple follow-ups. Bob, uh, when you rolled out the McDonald's sustainability vision for 2020, you said, and this is, I, I quote, we're on our way to mainstreaming sustainability. What does that mean and how close do you think we are to attaining that? Yeah, I, you know, hey, when Mc, you mentioned Walmart, you know, McDonald's, when these big companies that serve a lot of people are integrating sustainability, I mean, isn't that kind of symbolic of mainstreaming? Uh, and I think we're getting closer and closer. You know, my definition of it is, uh, you know, our vision at McDonald's was never a little bit different than maybe what you talked about. You know, we, we just don't see sustainability as being something niche or premium or something that costs extra. It's sort of like, looking at quality and safety. You know, it's just like, okay, do you pay extra for being high quality? Do you pay extra for you know, having a real safe supply chain? So anyway, that, that's our, our mindset. And uh, when it comes to uh, mainstreaming, you know, I know we're getting close because our, I convinced our head of supply chain for all of McDonald's Global to be, give a big speech at the worldwide convention for 15,000 people for McDonald's in 2002. And we had all of our suppliers in a room that make all the stuff from McDonald's. And there was about 700 supplier people there. And believe it or not, that was our introduction of the, the whole sustainability thing. And he talked about it being the fourth element of supply chain. It's quality, service, value, and now sustainability. Well, when he was finished talking for about a half hour, you could hear a pin drop. Sort of like how quiet this room is right now. <laughs> and the pin drop, meaning, and I heard a discussion afterwards, Nobody knew what the heck he was talking about. And that's 2002. And uh, by the way, the first chief sustainability officer in corporate America was when? It was 2004, DuPont. Now, almost every, I mean, just look at every major company, every major brand, they have chief sustainability officers or officers in charge of it. I just met with the head of sustainability at McDonald's, my good friend, Francesca DiBiase, who took over after I left. I was a lone ranger for many of my 33 years heading sustainability. I might have had a staff of four or five people for some of those years. He told me she has 42 people working on sustainability. You, know, you don't do this because it's a, a PR effort. You do it because it's a C-suite initiative. Mainstreaming means that within the business, the non-financial area is becoming as important as the financial area. So and a lot of businesses way beyond McDonald's are saying, hey, they're setting big goals and targets and metrics and accountability to show what they're doing on sustainability because you're not sustainable unless you actually can sort of prove it. And uh, that's part of sharing the, the story. So yeah, I think we're getting close. You know, I, I think small to mid-sized companies aren't there yet. And uh, I think parts of the supply chain, I think the ag industry has a, a great industry, I mean, a, a great opportunity here. Because in general, if you look at all the other parts of society, the sustainability curve, I think, has been growing at a fast clip. I think in ag, we're still, still learning. There's some resistance. I heard some comments about that this morning. And I think the fact is, uh, it, it's here, you can learn from everybody else, and the sooner you join the, the mainstreaming bandwagon, I think the more you're going to prosper and serve the ultimate consumer who's expecting this. Great. Alex, um, there's been a lot of talk about this whole Project Gigaton thing, and uh, Bob just mentioned it. Um, Nestle is also, I believe, one of the... Walmart giga gurus, um, you're in it with both feet, I know. Um, explain a little bit about how you look at Walmart's initiative and what do you see its effect on, on food manufacturing? So Walmart has been on a sustainability kick 
you could almost say since Sam uh, invented the concept of Walmart supply chain system. Sam Walton, I don't know if you've been to the Bentonville office, but Sam was a great guy and he was a pilot. He would get up in the morning, get in his plane and fly around to county road intersections and count cars from his plane up above. And the way Sam actually built that business was he'd build a DC and then he'd build stores around that DC and he'd go build another DC and he'd build stores around that. They've been in, this, they've been in um, understanding logistics and supply chain for a very long time. And Project Gigaton is a way that they're continuing to push that effort across their entire supplier base. What I would tell you is that um, one of the most difficult things in interacting with Walmart is knowing everything that's going on with your business and being able to tell the sustainability story about your products. And what ends up happening is that sustainability story stays with the um, C-suite of the sustainability guy or it stays with the supply chain team. And one of the things that will make you much, much more successful is being able to make that information ubiquitous through your organization and simple. Because the people interacting with Walmart to get that additional SKU on the shelf is not a sustainability expert, it's your salesperson. And if you have a super complicated sustainability story, they can't tell it. So one of the most important things is that you um, help simplify that storyline to make your selling process to a big retailer very simple. Uh, and you could see what I loved Frank's um, presentation, just the piece of paper, right? To think about agricultural land space, that way of simplifying the storyline about what makes your products clear and advantaged versus the competition is going to be the way you succeed with Walmart and with every other retailer who's trying to make a difference uh, in, the, in the US market. David, does Walmart effect trickle down to, to your business? Uh, yes, it is. And some of those, I, I'd say it's working its way down the supply chain. Kind of the, the primary questions we get right now in our business is, one is really, like, do you have goals? What are you doing? It's not so much that you have to be here. It's do you have goals and are you improving? So with that, you're going to hear this theme of continuous improvement. Are you working to get better in that direction is actually more important than kind of where you are today. And then kind of secondly, what we hear is what do you measure, right? So if you're going to have goals and do that, do you actually measure things? And can you show me that you're doing what you say? That's part of that building trust, right? Trust but verify piece of the equation. And so that, that becomes really important. And then, and then transparency is, OK, you're doing this. Now will you show me? So will you let me in and will let, you, let me see what you're doing, what those goals are, and how they go through the supply chain and where you're going? So we really said, right now, those are the big things. How do we kind of show continuous improvement? How do we measure? And how do we build transparency through that supply chain? Great. OK, Linda, switching gears here a little. Are consumers shopping with their brains or their hearts? <laughs> and are they willing to put some kind of monetary value on this whole thing? Well, I want to first build on the, the story I've heard here because I couldn't agree more about the fact that we need to simplify our story, focus in on what really matters, and for the consumer, make it a shareable story, a relatable story, so that it's not just your story, it's a story they want to tell for you. And be, the reason they want to tell your story or will even care to tell your story is because it strikes an emotional chord. And this is the heart of your question. Is it about emotion or facts? Yes, at the bottom of the pile of information that matters to them, the facts do matter. But at the very top of their playlist, are all the emotional reasons why this is right, right to do, and right for me, and right for my family. We have to learn how to sell and tell our stories with an emotional lens that is relatable to consumers, that matters to consumers, so that they will carry the stats, the facts, the figures, the KPIs, the goals, whatever it is you want them to share. But we have to tell it through that emotional lens. And so I think maybe years ago, we might have complained that they're making ridiculous assumptions and ridiculous comments, and it's all based on emotion, and it's not based on fact. And so how can we play this game? Well, we can play this game. 
We can. We start with where they are. Start with the heart. Work on what's mattering to them, what matters in their minds, and then bring them facts, facts and stats that bring that story to life, that take them to a place where they're feeling better about you, about what you do. I, I do think that it's both fact and emotion. Great. Just a reminder to everyone, uh, if you've got questions, fill out a card. Uh, and make sure if the runners are around, pick those up and bring them up to me. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll throw one more out to the whole group here. Um, do you see any regional differences between California consumers and the rest of the U.S.? And uh, what, what's going on there? Any thoughts? I'll throw out, you're going to hear a little bit about some surveying that we did, and some of you participated in the survey a little later in the afternoon. Um, as we looked at the U.S. in a very quick snapshot through an omnibus poll, we actually pulled out the California tab to see if the questions about importance of sustainability and what mattered registered any differently in California. And frankly, it was very, very much the same, very much the same. There was maybe a slight uptick. Um, but, you know, I, I think that we underestimate that middle America cares just as much as the coast. Um, how they care and how they express that might be different, and that's why we may be making some assumptions that they're not as vocal or they're not as engaged in the sustainability movement. The truth is they are, but they're, they're talking differently, they're communicating differently and in different ways, but they all carry the same set of values. I think, you're, to your point, it is about shared values, and this is a, a nation that is deeply needing to feel a sense of common goals, common good, and shared values. And I think this story is one they want to get their arms around, and they can. And they feel like they can control it, because they have the power and the voice to help us go in a better direction. At McDonald's, I, I know that the, uh, as you know, McDonald's is mostly owned and operated by franchisees, about 95% are. And uh, there's about 5,000 owner-operators that uh, run the McDonald's business. And it was the owner-operators in California that were the, my best allies. They were the ones telling the, the corporate executives, get off your butt and we need to do more on sustainability because they represent the consumer that's in California, which is, uh, well, you know, while I agree with you, Linda, the, the fact is they're, they're just much more active on these issues and they care more, they act upon more it vocal. more. Yeah. Kind of reminds me of Europe. I mean, when I would travel into Europe, it's just, it's almost night and day. I would say that, you know, okay, the, the consumer in Europe, I mean, I'm generalizing, but if, if you put them at a, a 10 in terms of how they care about sustainability, the American consumer might be, you know, might be a 1. But in California, it would be a 10. So, you know, yeah, it's, it, it is different. Uh, but, our, but our research showed that the global consumer, they all cared, and that's your point. They all, they all acted upon it a little bit differently, differently. though. I would say the biggest difference is in ge geography. Now, there's only one Berkeley in all of, Cal in all of the US, right? The but really, I would think of it as an age thing. And I would be really careful that you find some people that you really respect uh, that are on the younger side. They may not be very informed, but it's actually really helpful to understand where they're at. Right. And um, you know, agriculture has a tendency to be a little bit older in the leadership spaces of this. And I would encourage you to find some younger people and just listen to their opinions. And they're not all that informed, but they are passionate about it. And the more you can understand um, their passions about this, the more you can start to make progress. I had a franchisee that uh, was a haagen franchisee in Boulder, Colorado, and she was the most outspoken person uh, in that franchise group, but it helped us move forward. We didn't do everything that, that she wanted us to do, but we made a lot of progress. And that sort of um, listening, I would say, is really valuable. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with some of that sentiment. And I hear the sentiment that really California consumers are not that much different than the rest of the country. I think maybe there's some differences in California. We like to regulate things before everybody else. So I think there's, let's say, more activity in that front. But from what consumers really want and the shared values, yeah. not much difference. And I'll go a step further. This is really a global conversation. This is not just a California conversation. It's not just a national. It's a global conversation. So as we're having this conversation with multinationals and customers around the world, this comes up. And we some pointed out before that we have, let's say, 
alternative proteins or substitutes trying to tell a sustainability story. We also have other countries and dairy producers in Australia, <coughs> New Zealand, and the EU trying to tell a sustainability story as well that we have to discuss and involve with. But it is, there's kind of shared values really around the globe that we see at this time. Okay, here's a question from the audience. Does the consumer understand the link between technology use on farm and how it helps to make their food sustainable and available? I can start with that. Um, you may, some of you may know that we proudly have supported and worked with the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance over the past many years. And we've been looking at the topic of technology and the distance between consumers and their understanding of technology, particularly when it comes to food. And there's, there's what we call the ick factor, that when you put technology and comments about technology together with food, you get sort of a, a gut reaction, I don't want to hear all that, that's too much, it's not very attractive or appetizing. Strangely though, we've dug into this a little further and what the younger consumers, particularly those who are millennials and younger, are looking at technology on the farm and they're extremely excited about what they see. They're extremely encouraged. They're very eager to hear more. And they're also very, very interested and willing to see more technology being used in actually processing and producing foods. Why? Because they do believe there's always a better way. There's always something better. And they want to constantly be given opportunities to explore what could be better. So I think you now have a growing audience of individuals who really do want to hear about that technology. Um, and you have to tell it in a way that's interesting and tell it in a way that resonates with what's, what's important to them. I, I, I want to add in here that uh, I think this question, I'm going to broaden the technology question to more of a science question. I would say it's my biggest concern about today and the future. Uh, I, I see so many signals that disturb me uh, that uh, good science is not winning uh, in the public domain. And uh, I can give you example after example within the McDonald's experience. The one I'll just bring up, and I still lose sleep over it, is the uh, GMO potato that uh, a supplier developed, got approved by the government, I think three or four years ago. I studied this potato. There was no doubt that it was better for the world. Uh, but when you start trying to explain to the customer that it uh, sort of eliminates acrylamides, uh, a possible carcinogenic, you know, you kind of wonder how you tell that story. Uh, and uh, it eliminates bruising. I probably can tell that story. It's, it's a tough story, but, no doubt. But, you know, how can I go to the company management and say, well, we should go to this GMO potato when you know that all of our research shows that, I mean, everybody, Tom, Dick, and Eric, they, they'd all be after us for Frankenstein fries, you know, our best-selling product. So, uh, you know, going antibiotic-free, going cage-free, and uh, all this stuff. It's just all these claims that aren't scientifically based. It's a confusing world. Uh, I think simplicity is winning out right now. And I think it's one of the forefronts of where we have to work together, the whole value chain, because uh, oftentimes farmers would come to us and say, well, McDonald's, it's your job to, you know, maybe educate. And like, we can barely staff our restaurants. You know, so, you know, how are we going to take on that? So I think how to take on this issue yeah. is the biggest challenge of our times, really. I see it. There is. There's no doubt that it has to be simplified. I mean, the tech, we've done research on It's called talk, talk Tech to Me. And then that research, we can see that there's a tipping point where too much technology is too much information. So you have to know where the limits and the boundaries are of the story you're going to tell and tell it in a relevant way, but a factual way as well. Yeah, it, it, and I just, uh, technology is essential. Like, I don't, I mean, the example I use, if we are still practicing medicine like we were in the 1800s, I think there'd be a Where lot less be? of us around, right? And I think For if we're sure. still practicing farming like we were in the 1800s in another 50 years, there's probably going to be a lot less of us around when we look at that population growth. So it's a really, I agree with the comments from Linda, it's a really difficult conversation, but it's one we really have to have. And, and I think what, 
what gets so dangerous, and, and we really do ourselves a great disservice when we either exclude technology or exclude certain practices like GMOs, the use of GMOs, or certain farming systems like conventional or organic or grass-fed. When we focus on kind of practices and farming systems, we do ourselves a great disservice instead of really focusing on outcomes. And I think really the task in this conversation right. is to point to these outcomes. And really, there's, that's where the shared values it's are. It's outcomes too. The, and benefits. The, the social right. outcomes, the environmental the benefits. benefits that are there. And we each have to learn to tell our story about the practices and the farming systems that we employ and how they contribute to those outcomes. Right. And actually, the, the, there's differences, too. So one practice or system or product might be right for California, but it not, might not be right for India, and it might not be right for Wisconsin. So. I really think if we turn the dialogue to focus on those outcomes, we get a much better outcome overall and an optimal outcome. If we focus just on systems and practices, we're going to get a suboptimal outcome. Exactly. OK. Here's one, several questions along the same line. Um, it seems that large companies set global reduction goals but put little or no skin in the game. Rather, they force everyone down in the chain, including farmers, to reduce in order for them to succeed. When do these companies put money and skin into their reductions? Uh, I'll, I'll see if I can start with that, and maybe you guys can back me up on it. You're, you're the biggest. I'm you the, get to I'm start the, first. The, the, <laughs> So uh, what ends up happening in this space is that the pressure feels like it's only on one group. The reality is it's happening throughout the entire value chain. Um, the pressure that we're putting on our factories to be zero waste to landfill, to be uh, municipal water free, the capital investments that we're making in our factories to make a huge change is not always what we talk to our suppliers about, right? So you feel the pressure from, and I'm not in procurement, but you feel the pressure uh, as we're trying to work through the entire value chain and we don't end up talking about the things that we're doing in our own house. And so what I would say is that I think it's a go and look at what we are publishing to our shareholders and to consumers in uh, what at Nestle we call our CSV report, creating shared value. And you'll see that it is, as George Carlin, the famous comedian, would say sort of equal opportunity offender. We're putting pressure on everyone because consumers are doing it and our retailers are doing it. And so that's sort of the space that we're in and it isn't gonna change. Well, I got a feeling McDonald's might have been in that question somewhere. And uh, I, I think to some point, I think guilty as charged to a certain extent on some issues. You, you know, McDonald's was, it takes a long time to answer this, which I don't have time, but yeah, yeah, we, we forced some things down a supply chain on laying hens and gestation stalls and probably learned a lesson the hard way that that's not the right way to do it. But, you know, in terms of a retail business that's trying to please the consumer, you know, a consumer that wants to feel good about the food, and I haven't had a chance to talk about this whole brand health of McDonald's and how it measures it, but when McDonald's looks at its business skyrocketing like this and its brand health like this, that's basically you know, what McDonald's has been going through. You can understand why they might make some decisions like this. So I really think it's important to, uh, to do things together. I think the role model for you know, McDonald's of today is its work on the round table for sustainable beef that's in the US globally. I mean, everybody's on the, on the table defining what it means. I think that's a role model for how to approach sustainability holistically, broadly, the stakeholders defining it, agreeing upon it. I mean, I just think that's kind of the uh, prime example of the way it should be done, and McDonald's is now doing that. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I'd just maybe add, maybe take a little different angle, because there's also a question that comes up in there, especially um, now in what I'll call very difficult markets in dairy times, kind of, of asking us to do more when dairy farm sustainability is just an issue, and some people really feel that, and that's a real issue for that. And I. I think it's like really important that that is part of the conversation. And actually, the, the beauty of this conversation is it allows that to be part of the conversation. Because you hear a lot of, you heard in our th healthy people, planet, animals, it's not about one or the other. It's kind of both and, those together in that equa equation. But I, I think the real trick, and this is true for us and it's true for producers, I think, is 
The, tr the trick is that is to not get in the trap, caught in the trap of saying, we're going to only do this if it makes money or if you pay me for it. Uh, because while this, I often believe, is not what people mean, what that sounds like to consumers or to customers in a sense, is I'm financially motivated, I don't have an ethic. And what they're listening for, what consumers are really listening for, is do you have an ethic? When nobody's watching, do you really care? Are you going to take care of your employees? Are you going to take care of your animals? Are you going to take care of that ground? And I know, I know dairy farmers. and. Typically, you're not in that business unless you care for animals. You don't get into that business just for the fun. You really enjoy and care for animals. And typically, you're stewards of the land, too. So that is our story. So as we engage in that dialogue, what I really encourage is we have to affirm that and tell that story. And then we can have the economic viability discussion. So that really earns the right to have that discussion. It definitely has to be at the table. But we first have to demonstrate that we have the ethic and we're committed and tell that piece of the story. If you try to do the other one first, it's, it's a losing battle. Great. Thank you. One more I think we have time for. Um, how do we change the public view? How do you start to change our story in the dairy business to show, teach, and let them know we do care? I'll give it a start. You have tremendous stories. I mean, Dr. Frank, my gosh, every individual here is filled with stories mm -hmm. that no one's heard. Not enough people have heard. Stories that are on your farm, in your operations, in your businesses that you have a voice, and you are the individual ambassadors of your own destiny. And the only way you will be heard is to enter into the conversation and be part of the jet stream, or be left behind. We can't criticize what others are saying unless we are part of the conversation. And that means we need, yes, to do this, <laughs> I know you're running farms, and you have no time for this. But it's amazing how a little tweet here, or a little post there, or an opportunity to tell your stories individually in as many different places as possible that are amplified, others will take your story and share it with others. And that's the idea. So if we only tell our stories to the guy at the corner grocery store, and it stops there, it's a dead end story. But if we tell our stories through amplified technologies and we learn how to do it and we help others tell our stories for us, we can change the direction of public opinion. We can change what people know and don't know. We can't complain that people are ill-informed or don't know what they're talking about unless every single one of us is taking personal responsibility to change that dynamic by entering into the conversation. I, I couldn't agree more that telling our story is such a big part of this equation. I, you know, I, and we, we really have a great story to tell. And if we don't tell it, others will tell that story for us. I often, I often say, uh, we don't have a sustainability problem. What we have is a communication problem. <laughs> and if you're like me, I mean, I don't know, how many dairy farmers are in the room? So I, I see a lot of you. Okay, how, ma how many of you at some point in time had a conversation with your mother or father about how to take care of a cow or how to treat a cow and how to approach an animal, right? I think probably, it, I got to see the hands. Same number of hands go. <laughs> how many ever had a conversation with mom or dad about being a steward of the land? OK, a lot of hands going up as well. How many of you had a conversation with mom or dad about how to post things on Facebook? <laughs> and about how going downtown and talking about the wonderful donations we made and how we've provided economic viability for our employees and an opportunity to grow and raise kids and send them to college and folks who never had a chance to do that. We're just not, we're not kind of trained and experienced in talking about that. And that's a switch. We've had to learn that as an organization to get more comfortable about talking about the things we do and changing the language. So all of, all of you in the dairy industry provide open space. Do you know how, much, how many acres of open space and habitat you provide? Do you know how many 
tons, thousands of tons a year of products and food waste that you recycle on your dairy farm? Do you know how, many, how much electricity you generate with your methane digester? Do you know how much GHG, how much you've reduced your carbon footprint? Because I, I, I I'm just about guarantee that every single one of you has reduced your carbon footprint in the last 20 years because the game is really all about efficiency and you've all done that, the stats say in California. So can we frame up and tell our story in those terms and say, yeah, consumer, I agree with you. I'm, I'm all for these social concerns too. And here's the things I'm already doing today. This is not about doing different things. This is what I'm already doing today and how they contribute to that goal. If we don't tell that story, somebody else will. And our competitors are already doing that. They do. You know, I, I have a different point of view. Not that I disagree with what you said, but because there is a communication problem. But I think the problem is bigger than that. And it, it's, it starts more at the strategy level. And, and so you know, you're not going to be able to communicate this out of this thing unless you, at, at a very big level, you know, my message would be, unlike the McDonald's story where I said we were playing defense for 20, 25 years, uh, I still view the broader ag industry uh, as playing defense, you know, sitting around, mm -hmm. letting others control the, the story. And it just, it sickens my heart to see it because I know and I've been, <laughs> You know, part of my job was to visit all the farms and producers, and I, I see what you do, and I think it's fantastic. But I don't disagree with, and by the way, I cringe when I hear the word telling our story. I just got to say that. <laughs> because it isn't that way. You got to share the story. Share it. uh, it's a whole different mindset. And, and I'm going to continue to, to cry that yeah. because everybody says you got to tell the story. But you have to play offense first. If you don't have a strategy, if you don't have a framework, if you don't have a mission and goal, you know, all you're going to be looked upon is, you know, these little one-off things that you're doing. And one-off stories are not going to work. You have to show that you are, you mean it from the top, here it is, and then your storyline and uh, sharing that follows through playing offense. Uh, it's just so important. You have time to do it. Yeah. I'll give you one last thought on that. If you can't do it in a cave painting, literally a cave painting, if you can't do it in a simple picture, stop. You haven't got it simple enough. And so Frank's whole presentation was anchored on four bullet points that he disproved, basically. It was four bullet points. It wasn't a whole lecture. And pictures tell a thousand words, and he used a bunch of graphs. If you can show something super basic that you could put on a cave wall, you will win but we tend to make stuff way too complicated. So think about those cave paintings and uh, you'll tell a much better story. Hey Frank, is your, I want to get that thing going viral on YouTube. Has anybody taped you doing the, uh, <laughs> we, we got to do that. Make a gif, gif out of it, yeah. Okay, well we are out of time, but uh, thank you to our panel very much, appreciate it. Thank you, thank you.